Welcome back to another installment of Lens Days. In this video, we are going to talk about two different Fujifilm lenses that are the same focal length. So this is one of my favorite lenses ever made for any camera. This is the Fujifilm XF 16mm f1.4. This is a newer lens that was released this year. I voted this one of my best wide angles in the lens best of that I did last week. This is the Fujifilm XF 16mm f2.8. This is a compact prime. This one is a lot bigger and I get asked quite often, what are the the differences between these two lenses. They have different apertures for maximum aperture. They have very much different sizes. This is a thousand dollar lens. This is only a four hundred dollar lens. So is this one not as good as this one or what's the difference? Which one do I need to get for my system? And so we're going to break these down and talk about them today. But first I want to give a shout out to our sponsor who are the awesome folks over at audible.com. Audible.com is the world's largest seller and producer of audiobooks. They literally have reinvented media in their approach to programming. Audiobooks offer an excellent Excellent way of consuming best-selling titles when you're on the go as you can listen on just about any device. I love audiobooks when I'm commuting or when I'm at the gym. It's become something that I really look forward to. One of the titles that I'm currently listening to is Tom Sawyer, narrated by Nick Offerman, which is quite a matchup. You can get this book absolutely free by trying Audible for yourself for 30 days. You'll get one audiobook and two Audible originals by visiting audible.com slash Ted Forbes, or you can just text my name, all one word, no space, Ted Forbes, to 500-500 on your mobile phone. I think you're going to really love how audiobooks can enrich your day to day, so check them out. And I want to give a special shout out and thanks to audible.com for sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. Okay, so 16 millimeter versus 16 millimeter. What is the difference? Now, this is a lens that I've owned for about two years. I've talked a lot about it in these videos, and I quite often get asked if I can compare this to, say, the Sony 24 millimeter G Master, and I kind of don't do that because this is not a 24 millimeter lens. These are APS C lenses, and they give you an equivalent of a 24 millimeter field of view on a Fujifilm camera or an APS-C camera. They are 16 millimeter lenses and people love to start making all these conversions in their head or they go online and look at the depth of field calculators. An easier way to remember it is this. This is not a 24 millimeter lens. It is a 16 millimeter lens. This is also a 16 millimeter lens. This is an f1.4. It lets in the same amount of light that a 24 millimeter f1.4 would theoretically. It's easy to start thinking that that changes because your depth of field might change in the way that renders. So we start making all these calculations and you will hear people say, well, this is really not an F1.4. It's an F, you know, this is a 16 millimeter lens. This is a 16 millimeter lens. It's just easier to refer to it for what it actually is. Now, I'm going to complicate this for you even further. So when I was doing my A-B testing and research for this video, a lot of times I would have the camera set up on a tripod and I would just change the lens out. And one thing I noticed really quickly is this is not a 16 millimeter lens. It's more like a 17 or 17.5. Check this out. So this is an example. It's just a dumb shot that was done on a tripod in my living room. This was done with the Compact Prime, the 2.8. And so when I change this out to the 1.4, you can see that, boom, we have a much more narrowed field of view, so it is just slightly longer. Now, this is not actually uncommon for manufacturers to do. A lot of times, the focal length is in the ballpark, so they'll go ahead and market it as a 16 millimeter just to avoid confusion with maybe the 18 millimeter, let's say, but either way, it's just a little longer. It's also interesting. I've never seen anybody point this out before. I don't think it's copy variants. I think that's actually the way the lens is designed, but it's not a big deal just for what it is. I wanted to point that out. All things not being the same at maximum aperture, when you stop both of these lenses down to about f4, f5.6, pretty much you can expect that you're going to get very similar performance out of both of them. You're going to expect the same kind of contrast, the same kind of sharpness. And so if you shoot a lot in daylight, you do a lot of street photography, you need the smaller size, you're going to get a heck of a deal at $400 for this lens. It is absolutely outstanding. On the other hand, if you need to be able to shoot in low light or if you want to work with like the minimum focusing distance and the 1.4 aperture and get the weird dreamy bouquet in the background, then spend the extra money and get this one. So there you go. I guess we're done with the video. Okay, I know you're not going to let me off that easily. I'm going to throw another wrench into this, and I wouldn't say this typically in a camera system with lenses that are the same focal length, but I think in Fujifilm's case, and particularly with the two 16 millimeters, if you have the budget, I would actually recommend owning both of these because lenses are tools. I say this in every 
Wednesday's video and understanding what the tool will get done on the job that you're trying to do and that the job that you're using the lens for, that's what you need to understand as a photographer. And these lenses are very different from one another. And I think that is its greatest strength is they both offer something that is actually useful. So the greatest strength of the compact version of this lens is the size. And that actually is something that matters when you're shooting images. I think that Fujifilm make an excellent system for street photography. And when you're shooting street, particularly if you're out in the day, it's important for you to try to be a little bit stealth as a photographer to stay out of the way. You don't want to be noticed and to have lighter equipment and a much smaller lens is a huge asset to you in that type of situation. On the other hand, the F 1.4 version is two stops brighter. So if you're shooting in low light and that is something that you need, you really don't have a choice but to go with something that's bigger and unfortunately more expensive. In the first lens days video, I talked about the approach that designers take to designing optics and it's like anything else in photography. If you want to gain in one area, everything is a compromise. You generally have to give up something in another area. So for instance, exposure triangle, right? If I want to have a wider aperture, I'm going to overexpose unless I give up in another area. So I need either a faster shutter speed or a lower ISO setting. So everything is a system of give and take and lens design is no different. In optics design, this includes things like the size of the lens versus the price of the lens versus the maximum aperture versus the number of elements that you have in the lens how much glass is going on in here. One thing to note as well is that the wider the aperture, the more difficult it becomes to make corrections for the seven deadly aberrations, which include things like coma, astigmatism, chromatic aberration, light fall off, so on and so forth. That will end up impacting both the price and usually the size of the lens too. I'll give you an example here. The F 2.8 compact version of this lens features 10 elements in eight groups. When we go up to F 1.4, we now have 13 elements in 11 groups. So it required more glass. It's also a lot bigger glass that we're using. So that impacted both the size and the price. Now what's also interesting is Fuji worked backwards on the 16 millimeters. The 1.4 has been out for a couple of years now. The F 2.8 just came out this year. So when you consider what went on at the Fuji factory when they had the design discussion, this is something they do across multiple primes in their lineup. The 23 millimeter has two different versions, one with a wider aperture as does the 35. There's a 50 and 56. Anyway, you get my drift. So what's interesting is going from the harder lens to do down to the easier one, the conversation probably went a little like, okay, hey, we need a compact 16 millimeter. So here's your parameters. It needs to be small and it also needs to be fairly inexpensive. So what are you going to do? So you come up with a simpler design with fewer elements involved and you come back to the table and you say, hey, we've got this. It'll fit the price point really well. It has great MTF charts and everybody says, great, what's the trade-off? and you said, well, two stops of light. And as someone who's never actually designed a lens, I make that sound like a pretty easy process, but I really am impressed with the fact that simplicity has yielded results that like had all the right gains in the right areas. It's affordable and it's compact. And though you have a two stop of light differential, it's actually on paper in the MTF charts, a sharper lens. Let's check that out for a second. I have a whole video explaining MTF charts, but just really quickly, this line that goes up and down represents the center of your lens since it's circular and symmetrical. And these two lines represent readings of two different line pairs. And the higher they are on this graph, the sharper they are as they go to the edge of the lens, which is over on the right. And you can see that at 15 line pairs, these are very different in how they respond and how they render. But we have pretty sharp lenses in both cases, but clearly the 2.8 or the one on the right, the compact lens is sharper wide open. Now these readings are taken wide open. These are both from Fujifilm. And so you're comparing a 1.4 aperture to an F 2.8 aperture. That's actually two stops of light. The, when you start to stop down the lens and you use a smaller aperture, you're going to have less light fall off and you're going to have an increase in contrast and also an increase in sharpness. So this is a bit of an unfair comparison. So the one on the left being taken wide open, when you stop this down, it's probably going to compete much better with the f 2.8. These next two MTFs were taken at 45 line pairs. And what you get out of this is a sense of resolution. So wide open, once again, the f 1.4 doesn't seem to compare or resolve as high as the f 2.8. And again, these are both wide open. So we're a little bit of apples to oranges here. As you stop the lens down, that will probably increase in sharpness as well. But I think it's very impressive that wide open, at least the XF 16 mm f 2.8 renders in both 15 line pairs and 45, which means you're going to get a very sharp lens wide open with a pretty high resolution as well.
well. And so as cameras have more megapixels to them, this is a lens that will hold up. So I did one of my own very unscientific, let me stress, unscientific tests just to see how sharpness looked in the corners on these particular copies. Typically MTFs are theoretical in this case. And I found that in my test shots, if you take this test chart and what I did is I put it up in the corner of the lens like this, got the camera as parallel to the test chart as I could, and I did a couple readings. So paying attention to the focus at the center of the star, yes, wide open, the 1.4 is a little bit softer than the f2.8. However, when you stop down the 1.4 to make it a little bit more even with the f2.8, sharpness, at least in my perception, is very much equal. And so again, and I need to stress, this is not scientific, but at least on a perceptual level, it tells me two things. First of all, the MTF charts seem fairly accurate, and second of all, it tells me that the theory holds up that once you start stopping down a lens, you are going to get a higher contrast and more sharpness. And this is something that's fundamentally kind of, I wouldn't say flawed, but it's misleading in terms of looking at MTF charts. Because when you're comparing two different aperture lenses, you're going to expect two completely different results. Another thing that is really important to mention is that when we get into MTF charts and we're looking at scientific data, there's a lot of hair splitting that's going on. Is this something that you're going to see in actual real world use? Now, when I shot the Zeiss test chart over in the corner of the lens and we're zooming in and we're pixel peeping, yes, when I see them side by side, I can perceive a difference. You probably can too. If you were just shown one of them and said, is this sharp? You'd probably say yes if you didn't see the other. It doesn't matter which one it is. So a lot of it is splitting hairs. And when you're looking for the best of the best and thinking that in the end, somehow that is going to make some impact on your image, it probably won't. Great photography always trumps sharpness image quality, blemishes in things like coma or aberration. I mean, just, those things don't matter when you get down to it. And so my point here is that we're looking at the MTF charts just to see how impressive these get, but there's a lot of considerations that you have to make. And quite honestly, you're probably not going to perceive a whole lot of these unless you really know what you're looking for. But the point here is that every time you increase that maximum aperture, you're going to pretty much ensure that you are going to double the price, if not more. And we're looking at two Fujifilm lenses that are wide angles. If you look at something like, let's say, Canon with the 50 millimeter f1.8, when you move up to the f1.4 or the f1.2, and at one point they had an f1.0, your price is going to go way up, and that's just how it is. Generally speaking, you have more corrections that you have to make in the optics. So you're going to have to have more elements. You're going to have to have bigger glass. You're going to have to have weird elements that are off shapes, like XA elements, aspherical elements, ED elements, materials, shapes, all those things are going to go into it and that's where your price goes up. And I say this because people always leave comments saying, well, the day that Nikon releases an f1.2 lens, it's under a thousand bucks. That's the day I'm going to switch over. And it's like, well, you're not going to have that happen ever because Nikon have a standard that they have to meet in terms of optical quality and it's just not going to happen at a cheap price. Anyway, I think these two lenses both are a fabulous deal. And if you have the means to do it, I think they're different enough tools to where they both have different purposes. That's my weird recommendation is that you need to own both of these. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Drop me a comment below. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Until then, later.